Section 12.2 continued, example, balancing a horizontal beam. So in the figure, a uniform beam of length L and mass 1.8 kilograms is at rest on two scales. The uniform block with mass big M is 2.7 kilograms is at rest on the beam with its center a distance L over four from the beam's left end. What do the scales read? Okay. So I went ahead and jotted down what I observed from this problem, right? I started by drawing the picture, which we're going to interact more with in just a moment. I also wrote down what we know, uniform beam of length L, mass little m, uniform block, mass big M, and what we want is what the scales read. Now scales read, what is that asking for? Well, we have to think for a moment about what a scale actually reads when we step on it. It gives us our weight, but what it's actually registering is the amount that the scale has to push back to support us. So what this effectively is, is the normal force coming from the scales. So I'd write it as the normal force of each scale, which we have a left scale and the normal force um, from the right one. Now, do we expect those to be equal? Well, as we look at this, the uniform block, which is pretty heavy, is definitely closer to one scale. So I'd expect that that scale weighs more. But we can check, right? At the very least, I don't expect it to be balanced. Now, we're bringing in here these ideas of forces, and just in general, anytime with this chapter for the problems we're solving, we're probably gonna to wanna to use forces. So that means I wanna draw my forces on my picture. I wanna put them exactly where they are acting. So first, the normal force from the scales is how the scale is pushing back on the blocks, the block and the beam. So I can do that for my left side and then also for my right side, but those are both upward forces right at the point of contact. And then what other forces do we have? Well, first we might wanna decide what do we wanna focus on as our system. I'm gonna suggest that for our system, the simplest way to approach this is to treat the beam and the block together as um, the main focus of our system. Draw this dotted bit around here. That's our system. That means we only care about forces that are acting on the system, not any internal forces. We don't need to worry about the normal force between the beam and the block. But the force of gravity does still exist, right? We can't get away from gravity. It's always trying to bring us down. Where does the force of gravity act though? This is where the idea is of center of gravity are really important and center of mass, as well as the fact, this is why I wrote it down, that it's a uniform beam and a uniform block. The fact that it's uniform tells us where the center of gravity is. If it truly is uniform, it's gonna be right in the geometric middle. There is an extra mass at one end that's going to throw off where the center of mass is located. So for the beam, it would be right in the middle there. We could draw in that force, little m times g for the block. It would be in the very center of the block. We could draw that force as well. Big M times g. All right, so this is really good. We can also think about our tools. And because it's balanced, because nothing is tipping, we know that it's in equilibrium. So that's what we wanna think of with our tools that we have in all of these, F net in the X direction is equal to zero, F net in the Y direction is equal to zero, and the net torque is equal to zero. And I recommend starting with the balance of forces because they're the simplest ones to throw up there, right? We notice all these forces are vertical, so I'm not gonna worry about the X direction, but I will look at the net force in the Y direction and how those forces come to zero. And for this, all I have to do is figure out which forces are going up, which ones are going down. So I'd have 
f left plus f right minus big mg minus little mg have to come out to zero. And so this gives me one relationship, right, that I can find any of them in terms of, of these two unknown forces. So the force on the left is going to be the total weight and big mg plus little mg minus however much the right side is supporting it. So that's a great start. But it's not enough because we still have two unknowns. So just like in the last example, this is a point where we can now bring in our torques in order to get another equation, another relationship. And the key for torque, before we can do any torque anything, is we need to choose where we want to put our axis of rotation. And we can put it anywhere we want to. We're totally free to make that choice. In fact, there are multiple places that will work and get the right answer. So it's not even you can put anywhere you want or else. That said, though, there are places that will make your life easier if you put the axis of rotation there for calculating the torque. In this case, and in most cases, we want to put the axis of rotation at one of our unknown forces. Because if we place our axis there, then that force won't contribute any torque. So it eliminates one of our unknowns without having a system of equations with two unknowns, two equations. So that tells me I want to put it either on the left side or on the right side of the beam. And we can do either. It doesn't particularly matter which. The only advantage to doing it on the left side is that notice my distances are already defined relative to the left side. So that can make it slightly easier. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But I encourage you to give it a try with defining it from the right side. And check if you get the same result, because it should work out to give you the same result. All right, so now we're looking at some of the torques being equal to 0. And so for the net torques, that's going to involve each of these times their distances. And once again, I'm going to be focusing on using, calculating the torque with the force times the r perpendicular. Because if we know that perpendicular distance, the moment arm or the lever arm, then we're going to have an easier time calculating the torque. All right, so for torque net about left side equals zero. And so I'm going to have, let's see, big mg times its r. I'm also going to have one for little mg times its r. And then finally, fr times its radius. And we'll also need a sign there. So first, big mg. How far away is it from the axis of rotation? Well, from the axis of rotation to the middle of it is just this L over 4. And we don't know what L is, but they tell us L, capital L, is a variable, so we can solve in terms of it. And maybe it'll cancel out, or if not, because they gave us L as a thing, then that's OK. So I'll just put in L over 4 here. I also want to put in the sign. So notice this big MG is causing a clockwise rotation. So that is going to be negative. I notice I'm getting a little low. So we'll turn this, tilt this down a touch. OK, little MG, how far away is it from the axis of rotation? Well, because it's at the center of mass, because it's a uniform beam, it's going to be exactly halfway between. So it's going to be at L over 2. This one is also creating a clockwise torque about this particular axis of rotation. So I'd use a minus sign there. Finally, FR is at the full length of the beam away, L away. And that is causing a counterclockwise rotation, so that is positive. And what you may notice here is that all of the terms here have an L in it. So we're able to divide out the L. So we don't need to worry about that. So that's cool. That canceled out. If I add my two negative ones to the other side, then we actually have an equation right away for F sub R. So let's see. So F sub R is equal to 
big mg divided by 4 plus little mg divided by 2. Cool. And this is now something we can solve. We know both our masses. And so we can plug those in along with g. And then we can go up to the balance of forces equation and get that as well. So let's see, big M is 2.7 times 9.8 meters per second squared. And I lost the kilograms there. Divide by four. Sorry, that got really messy. Plus little m is 1.8 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, all divided by 2. There we go. Okay, and so if we plug this in, we should get that FR comes out to 15. With what units? Newtons, right? Because this is still a force. So what we've seen before still applies. Okay, and then we can take this up here and solve for the weights of each of these, 1.8 kilograms times g, 2.7 kilograms times g, minus f sub r there. And what we should get, if you calculate that out, is you should find that it is 29. And that then balances it all out. And so we're able to figure out the force on each of these, and notice it matches what we expected, that the left side is 29. It's almost twice as much as the right side, because the left side is doing a lot more work of supporting this giant block than the right side. The right side's kind of slacking off in comparison. So that pulls us through this example. You can see the abbreviated solution in the slides here, and there we have it. So balancing a horizontal beam using balance of forces as well as balance of torques.